Hi, I'm Christy Maver, and I'm sitting here with Jeff Hawkins and Sumitai Amon. And we do this once a year. We sit down. We're, we're at the start of a new year. It's January 2020. And every year we sit down and reflect on the previous year and look ahead in the coming year, what lies ahead. So I sat down with the two of you about a year ago. And it was a pretty exciting time for Numenta. We were talking about, we were going through this rebalancing of our dual missions. So to remind people of our dual missions, the first one is a scientific mission, which is uh, reverse engineering the neocortex, figuring out how the brain works. That's a biological scientific mission. And then the second mission is really applying those principles to the field of machine intelligence. Um, and so Subutai, a year ago, you were lead, kicking off an effort to really explore um, that mission um, and take the principles of our theory and see how they could apply to practical problems. And um, one of the things that you said last year was, you know, that the theory is pretty comprehensive. It goes all the way down to synapses and dendrites. And so it was kind of this optimistic and yet who knows where that this will take us feeling. So here we are a year later. Where did it take us? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about where we are. Uh, so about a year ago, um, I think you know the frameworks paper had been published, and I just started looking to see how we can take all of the neuroscience principles that we had developed actually over the last ten years, mm -hmm. and seeing how we can now start applying them to practical systems and machine learning. And I'd say over the year, and we didn't really know where it would go. Mm -hmm. um, but during the year, I think we made a ton of progress. We've uh, published a paper on archive uh, showing that sparsity uh, in the way that it's done in the neocortex can help improve robustness. Uh, even, even in deep learning systems. Uh, we've spoken about it at numerous conferences and, and presentations and so on, and I think the reception has been really great. I think people are really interested in seeing that neuroscience can actually positively impact machine learning, which is right. a rare thing uh, these days. So uh, that's been great to see, and we've really ramped up our efforts on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to look at all different aspects of sparsity and some of these other principles and how they can uh, start applying to machine learning. Do you feel like one of the things you noted last year was that there there were increasingly vocalizations from leaders on the AI side of things saying, you know, they were recognizing the limitations of existing deep learning systems and it seemed like more of them were turning towards the brain. So do you do you notice that in terms of the reception of our work? Is there is that trend continuing? Yeah, I think that trend is definitely com continuing. There are lots of keynote talks at these major conferences on on that topic on the limitations and even looking at how neuroscience can help. So I think that trend is going to continue and that's only been, that's been very helpful uh, from our standpoint as well. Great. Of course, we thought that from for right. the last 20 years. So. But it's nice to see it come yeah, to fruition. Exactly. Yeah. So you Some mentioned right, for <laughs> even longer, yes, yeah. for perhaps decades. Um, yeah. You mentioned this the frameworks paper, um, which is uh, a framework for intelligence and cortical function based on grid cells in the neocortex. Um, Jeff, I want to ask you a little bit about this because that paper was published in the peer-reviewed journal of Frontiers and Neural Networks last January. Yeah. So that kicked off 2019, um, and and you talked about that paper last year because we had released it on archive, and it's it's really Really, a, I think you, you said it was a rethinking of how the neocortex worked. It introduced a new framework. It had some really big ideas in it, one of which was what we call the thousand brains theory of intelligence. So yeah. can you remind people what that is and, and why it's so important, It's why it's yeah. foundational to our work? Yeah, so uh, a little bit more background on that, right? Great. Because um, I got into this field, they're interested in this, in the, the AI and the, and the, the neuroscience part. Literally 40 years ago. Uh, 40, 40, 40 years ago. 40 yes. years. I, was, yes. I was a very young man. <laughs> right. And um, when uh, Francis Crick wrote this paper about, um, about the brain, in which he uh, essentially said, uh, we don't really understand how the brain works, um, and it's not because we don't have enough data, it's because we haven't organized the data we have correctly. And he says we need a new framework uh, in which to... Uh, his exact words, we need a framework in which to interpret all the different neuroscience results we had. And that was my um, personal um, motivation. Uh, that essay and that particular quest to find that framework, what, how do we take all this neuroscience data and explain how the brain works, that is what I set out in my life to do. Uh, so it took a long time. The framework paper is, in many ways, the answer to that question. And it's, it, it's not a coincidence that they both talk about a framework because it isn't it isn't the, the it is a basic a way of understanding how the brain works as a whole and that had it's really novel 
And there are two, um, in that paper, we introduced um, two sort of two major novelties to the whole thing. Uh, one was um, the idea that throughout the neocortex, which is, of course, you know, 70% of your brain, the big wrinkly sheet up here, throughout the neocortex, uh, there are um, cells, we believe they're like what are called grid cells, which are no part of the brain, but essentially they're reference frames. And so the brain takes its inputs and it puts everything in some reference frames in the world and how neurons do this and so on. So that, and those are what grid cells do. So we explained how that is in organizing, how all information in the brain is, is organized around these reference frames, which are grid, for, grid cells. But one of the consequences that came out of that, which we did not anticipate going in, uh, was a sort of a surprise, but obvious in hindsight, was that um, since these reference frames exist everywhere in the neocortex, every part of the neocortex is building models, complete models of the world. We, it, prior to that point, most people thought that the brain took all this input and got it to come up to one point, and, and, and this is where you recognize this, and this is where you recognize that kind of thing. And now we realize that that's not true at all. There are thousands and thousands of models of everything. Uh, every cortical column is a complete modeling system. And, uh, and how they work together. So we introduced that uh, concept. I, I don't know if it's the first time, but I'm not aware of anyone else having, having that. Idea. But it's a, it's a major, those two things were really sort of laid out in a cohesive way, hopefully. We tried to do it at least in a cohesive way in that paper. Um, really in an answer to Frick's, uh, Frick, Frick, Francis Frick's, Frick. um, uh, his, his quest or his uh, proposition 40 years ago. And in that way, I felt it was a very, um, uh, for, at least for our point of view, a very seminal paper, and hopefully a seminal paper for uh, neuroscience in general. Right. And so in terms of the, the continuing neuroscience work for Numenta, now is it really more about kind of filling in the details it is, of that framework? It is. I, I've made this analogy <laughs> multiple times. It's, it's like the brain is like a big puzzle, and you have thousands of puzzle pieces, and uh, without a framework, they're just sitting on the table. You don't know how they go together. You don't know what the picture is. Mm -hmm. um, and so all you do is you try to put a little piece here, a little piece there, and it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it's been like. We have lots and lots of data. But what the framework does is, it, it, the, by analogy, it's like, oh, we've now put in the, the border pieces, uh, and we know what the picture looks like. Um, and there's lots of places that we haven't filled in yet. And we have lots of pieces to fill them in, but we kind of know what's going to, we know this is what it is, this is the size of it, this is what the whole picture looks like, and now we're filling in these pieces. Some of those pieces uh, are more interesting to us than others. Um, I mean, the brain is still very, very complicated, um, but uh, so we, there's some things uh, that, um, that I personally want to work on further. But with that framework, we felt that was a good time to really take this, um, this focus uh, and go back to sort of the machine learning side of things or the AI side of things. So uh, we're doing somewhere a, a bit more neuroscience here. People who follow our work know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've really shifted this. The, the majority of the work here has been the move to um, uh, the machine learning work on the, on the supertype. The supertype, right. Um, let me ask you also, I, I know one thing that you were working on a lot in 2019 is your next book. Yeah, you, which, you know because you've been working I, on it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, but you've talked about this in some uh public forums, but yeah. um, but l let me ask you to, to explain to our followers, what is this book about that you're uh, working on? Yeah, well, the book is, is trying to, um, it does it does two things, well, one could argue three things, but um, first of all, it describes all the neuroscience we've done uh, since we started in, in a, a form that puts it in one big picture and in terms that any person can understand. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can read our papers. They're hard. Um, the details of how these mechanisms work, the language, it can be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but many, many people are interested in the basic idea. How does the brain work? So the first part, half of the book is, is explaining basically the thousand brains theory of intelligence. It explains the whole grid cell idea. It explains uh, the earlier we, we did work we did in 2016 about how neurons make predictions. It puts that all into one sort of bundle that uh, an interested lay reader could say, okay, I want to understand how my brain works. Uh, what is, happens when I'm thinking, and I describe that. The next section of the book um, is really about um, my predictions, what's going to happen in the field of AI and machine intelligence. And uh, although we're working on it here, the way we're going about it now is, of course, very incremental, step by step, logical, but I'm more speculative in the book about where the ultimate goals are, where we're going to, where is it going to go, what are the machines going to be like. Um, it's almost as if, hey, once we build machines that do all the things we know that brains do, all the things that 
Subutai is laid out, um, what will their impact be? What will they be and what won't they be? And so, you know, I, I discuss things such as the existential risks of machine intelligence, and which is a topic many people are concerned mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. um, and how it impacts society. And then the last part of the book is something that most people, um, even who've been following me for my whole life, don't really know that I think a lot about, uh, which is sort of the ultimate impact of, uh, of well, the ultimate uh, destination of humanity in some sense. Um, you can think about, uh, just a brief, brief uh, summary of what this is about. We, life up to this very recent time has all been about evolution and of genetics and copying genes and building machines that make, you know, we are machines that copy genes is what we are. And in that process, we, uh, evolution has built this brain and now the brain has become this sort of a very powerful learning machine and it learns a model of the world and it's become, and it builds a model, of, uh, not of the world, but of itself, of your body. And so now in our heads, we have this model of what's going on and it's very deep and we've discovered the underlying process of everything. So now all of a sudden there is a system of so you might want to call self-aware that, oh, I, I, we got here by this process and this is how our brains work and this is how our bodies work. And, um, and that's a, a new thing. And, um, and we're still tied to our old bodies. We're tied to these genetically derived old systems that you know have all these biological needs and don't always behave in right, very good ways. And so, what are the implications going forward? Um, how can we use our intelligence to, for the first time, craft a future that's not purely driven by um, evolution? Um, and I won't give away the answers to that, but there, there, there are several. Yeah, there's several sort of, um, it takes a bit of thought and I want to go through it carefully. It's, it, you know, you could sound a little bit like science fiction, but I don't really mean it to be science fiction. I really want it to be right. uh, thoughtful about um, how can we use our intelligence to craft a future that makes sense, that provides meaning uh, for humanity and for our lives. Um, and there's some surprising things all happen there. Yes. I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. So I so I know one of your twenty twenty goals is to finish writing oh, yes. that book. Oh yeah. That's kind of long. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to you, Subutai. One one of the changes that um, we made in I think early twenty nineteen, the first half of twenty nineteen, was um, we opened up the research meetings to become to be live streamed. Um, which was something new for Numenta. So how, how was that experience for you? Did it change the research meetings at all or the well, interactions? You know, so that's really at Matt's kind of request. Mm, and, yes. and, and Matt we've Taylor, our yeah, Matt Taylor. manager. Uh, and we've tried not to change the research <laughs> meetings too much, too much. So we try to keep it going as it always has gone. So I think from the community standpoint, they can really see it fresh, the way we actually have our research meetings. We're not trying to tailor it to the audience or anything. So right. I would say not much has changed from that standpoint. Which is a good uh, thing. Which is yeah. a good thing. We keep it going. Uh, what's been interesting is sometimes when I go to these machine learning conferences, I've now run into people who are like, oh, yeah, I've watched your research meeting on this or that or whatever. I'm like, oh, really? So that's quite interesting. And, and you know, so I think it's only helped increase the awareness and people really respect us for doing it. It's extremely unusual. I don't know anyone else who does that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, really. Uh, kudos to Matt. Um, who you can't tell, but he's standing right over here. Um, <laughs> but kudos to Matt for doing that. Uh, I I think it's you know really, you know it's such a hard scientific problem we work on, and um, in academia is still very isolated towers of you know um, academia. Sure. And uh, the idea that uh, publicly sharing your dirty laundry and your mistakes and your um, and your puzzlement over these problems. Uh, was a very clever idea on Matt's part, and um, we didn't know how it would turn out. Um, and I guess there's some people who really like it. And to the extent that people like it and get something out of it, it's great. Um, I, I feel really good about it. Um, and as Supertai said, we really didn't have to change anything uh, other than occasionally not mention something proprietary for you know sure. business reasons or something like that. Um, but from a scientific point of, point of view, it's been um, it's just the way we are. It's um, good or bad. It's just what it is. You know. <laughs> So that will continue in, in uh, As long as Matt's willing to as keep doing it, yeah. it's going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so let me end with asking about, you know, it's the start of a new decade. So, of course, everyone's making predictions about what's to come over the next 10 years. You guys have both been with Numenta, at Numenta from the very beginning. So now we're entering a new decade. As you look ahead, I'll start with you, Subutai. What what lies ahead for Numenta the next 10 years? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. You know, if you look back at the last decade, I think mm -hmm. it's re really about 10 years ago that 
you know, Jeff first started thinking about active dendrites and prediction and sparsity and how that can all come together into the temporal memory. And it kind of started this whole, you know, uh, really in-depth uh, modeling of the neuroscience details, which we hadn't done before. So it's kind of fitting, I guess, that in 2020, we're sort of taking all of that and now starting to look in how to apply all of that. Uh, so, so 10 learning. years from now, we'll have the Frameworks AGI paper. AGI, exactly. Is that right? I think that's a good goal. That's Why a good not? goal, yeah. You know, of course, it'll have to be backed up by all of our working you know, uh, yeah, AGI yeah. Uh, software and hardware. And yeah, yeah. Okay. I think, and I think, I think that our pace is just going to accelerate because uh, you know, the, the last year and working on it has been really encouraging. It's, it's, uh, I think it's there's a path towards putting all of these principles into practical systems. Mm -hmm. And as we think about active dendrites and unsupervised learning and continuous learning and the temporal memory and, and location-based representations and the full cortical column idea, I think those will all, they all kind of build one on top of another. So I think they will all come, uh, uh, come to fruition. Um, and I don't think it'll take a full 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. The next part of it, uh, you know, alluding to your question earlier, I think the machine learning community is very open now to neuroscience information. And I predict over the next 10 years that there's going to be a much more crosstalk between the neuroscience and machine learning communities than ever before. So I think that's, I'm very hopeful about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to ask me the same question. I, I am, said. yes. Well, yeah, I, I like to double what Sibit I said, but I'll have to point out that when I first got interested in this, literally 40 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had this, first of all, I said to myself, oh, man, we're going to solve this brain problem. I thought I was going to be too late. I said, you know, there must be people who are more senior than me who are working on this now. They must be going on it, you know, in a few years, I'll have this all figured out. I wonder if I can do any of this because it'll be, I'm too late to come to the party. Well, that turned out to be wrong. And um, the other thing I thought that, I thought it would be totally obvious that the way to build intelligent machines was they can work like brains. I mean, this was just obvious to me. And yet, I'm surprised how long it's been uh, that that idea still hasn't taken off. Now, I'm optimistic, like Supertime. Maybe this looks really like the decade that people are going to say this. <laughs> but I've been surprised in the past. Um, but it does really look like it because now people, other people are really saying it. But I do think it will probably take a lot of work on our part to make it happen because I, I think we just are thinking on these issues. It's at least different. And, um, and if I want to... Uh, be more optimistic. I say, you know, we're the leaders in this kind of thinking, um, but um, it's it's not going to be easy. So that's backing up super time. Okay, um, you're doubling down on super Yeah, the other thing I hope to do is is uh, in the next ten years, uh, some of those ideas I was talking about um, uh, in in the book I, that I'm writing now. Uh, I don't expect them to come to fruition in the next ten years, um, but I do. Ex I would really be thrilled if those ideas became discussed broadly. Um, and you'll just have to wait till the book comes out. But um, but that those ideas, at least those ideas, are, are starting to permeate through um, uh, people's thoughts and, and uh, discussions about the future. It's exciting times. It always Very is. Good, yeah. Yeah. It always is. It always is. Yeah. Well, thank you both for sitting down with mm -hmm. me, and thank you all for continuing to follow Numenta, and happy 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cut.